The following is a production of the Ultimate Fantasy Sports Network. Welcome back to another episode of UFBA Today. I'm your host, Show Ali. Thank you for watching and listening and all that good stuff. Uh, another jam-packed episode here on the Ultimate Fantasy Sports Network. A lot of a lot of movers and shakers now that we are back in earnest from the All-Star break. I saw I spoke about last week how it felt like not a lot had happened over the All-Star break, and we did talk a little bit about All-Star Weekend in Cleveland, but now we are back. Games have been played in the NBA. The standings have changed across the UFBA. Uh, we have some injuries to talk about. And uh, honestly, it's kind of crazy that with all that stuff, it is now March. It's the beginning of March, which basically means uh, I believe the regular season in the NBA ends around April 10th, April 11th, maybe April 12th. I, I know COVID has sort of disrupted when games are played, but generally speaking, uh, I believe the NBA regular season will end 10, 11 days into April, which means that given we are recording this episode on March 2nd, it basically means that we have, eh, let's see what five, six weeks of the regular season left before we get into the playoffs. In our most regular fantasy basketball leagues, the playoffs probably are starting now, and you would go until the beginning of the actual playoffs in the NBA. But for UFF sports, what we like to do is we like to start, you know, we like to say things mirror real life as much as humanly possible. So uh, the playoffs start when the playoffs start in real life, right? So there is a play in round. And I think in the coming weeks, I've gotten some questions on how the play-in round will work from a fantasy perspective. So I think we will discuss that maybe next week or the week after. Um, The Futures auction is obviously coming up, and I'm going to be spending a lot of time talking about that on UFBA today. Uh, That's on Saturday, March 12th, in case you've forgotten. But don't worry, I will mention that date plenty here on the show. But uh, yeah, just keep all that in mind. Lots of stuff coming up, so please continue to set your lineups and uh, try and navigate the minefield of injuries as best you can. We will talk about some of those injuries on today's program but today's guest is Daniele Franceschi our UFBA scouting director he's the one who put together those lists you saw I guess it was two episodes ago now it's also available on the uffsports.com website on the under the news tab but Daniele is responsible for putting all that together honestly there might be no person I personally know like as a friend who knows more about college basketball than Daniele so I'm very pleased he is involved with the UFBA I'm pleased he's involved with uh you know, college basketball in general, and that he's joining us as our guest today. So we'll chat with him a little later on, but why don't we get into today's stuff by talking about the futures auction? Now, the reason I wanted to bring it up again was because, and I mentioned Saturday, March 12th, is the opening of the auction, 120 prospects, uh, 60 from the 2022 NBA draft class, 60 from the 23 NBA draft class. So 120 all being auctioned on that Saturday. The open market will open on the Monday, which I believe is March 14th at 6 p.m. Eastern, A little later, just because we have, uh, I believe we have a number of people in the UFBA and just kind of people who pay attention around the world who are from Italy, uh, which I believe I'm in Toronto. So Italy is, I think, five hours ahead. And I believe we have a number of people in Australia. Australia is a big place, so they have their own time zones as well. But I believe it's like 13 or 14 hours ahead, depending on where you are in Australia. So uh, we wanted to make it a a more accommodating for people who will have to be up early in the morning. So that's why it's at 6 p.m. Eastern when the open market opens, but uh, I'd gotten some questions on how the open market actually works. Like, how do you actually go in and register a new player? Okay, and that's totally valid, uh, especially for those who may not have done it before, because the process has been done, I think, for, especially for the football side of things on the UFAFL. But for us here, the UFBA, the way it works is you have to go to basketball.uffsports.com. You obviously have to have an account, so please register if you haven't done that yet. Also would have to register as a scout, but the way that works is you just kind of click register, and then uh, I, as the commissioner slash head of sport, I can go into the back end and approve any scout registrations, and it'll be the same thing for players. But the way it works is you go to that website. On the very top of your page, just below where you put in a URL, you'll see a little uh, link that says register new player. And when you click that, you, you'll see a bunch of fields pop up, name, birthday, uh, position, what are the other ones? Uh, name, position, birthday, uh, oh, right, hometown, birth country, and then you'll see one that says status. We'll talk about status at the end, but all of those are mandatory. I'll just say, please, 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 <laughs> please spell the player's name correctly. I think this is probably the one we'll have to be as strict as possible about because 
as you know, there are a number of different spellings, and this was, a, I think, an issue in the UFAFL as well. There are different spellings of different players uh, that are very similar, right? Like, let's use Jabari Smith as an example. Obviously, he's not going to be in the open market, but I'm sure there are Jabari's. His name is spelled J-A-B-R-I. I'm sure there's guys who are spelled J-E-B-R, uh, B-R-I, J-A-H-B-R-I. You know what I mean? Like, there's a whole bunch of different kinds of spellings. So please make sure that is correct because uh, the tie will go to the person who inputs the information correctly uh, is how we're going to kind of handle that on the open market. Um, when it comes to hometown, I know that might be a little confusing because some people maybe list where they grew up and not where they were born. I know there's like, for example, I think in the 22 class, uh, there's someone who was born in Poland and grew up in Croatia. So he lists his Croatian city as a place as his hometown, but not his place of birth, right? So all I ask is when you put in all of this information, it is somewhat relevant to the player you are uh, trying to register. If, if if the guy was born in New York, but he lives in Chicago and he says Chicago is his hometown, that's fine. Or if you put New York, that's fine. As long as we on the admin side can look it up and it is all correct, that is fine with me. And don't forget, eligibility requirements for uh, the members of this draft class are going to be born in the year 2004 or uh, I guess prior to that, right? 2004, 2003, going backwards from there. 2005, we'll try and leave that off for uh, the 2024 NBA draft class, I guess, and going forward. But that's for, you know, that's for later in the year or next year, of course. But uh, again, there you go. That's kind of how, in a rough summary, how it works. You have to fill out all those forms, all those fields on the form. There's some red asterisks, I think, in terms of what, uh, which mandatory, which fields are mandatory. So just keep that in mind. Um, you know, I know everyone's going to be rushing to kind of register players when the floodgates open on Monday, March 14th, but just try and enter as much of it as accurately as possible. If you don't know the player's birthday, also his specific birthday, you can always just put like January 1st, 2004, and we can uh, fix that at a later date. Cause I know the birthdays are not always readily available, especially for those guys who are still in high school. Typically when they get to college is when the information is now put on their college websites. But, uh, before then you don't always see it, uh, a, a pro tip scour their twitters they often tweet happy birthday to themselves which is great so i have learned a lot about uh, the, the the next generation of basketball players like to do that so there's a pro tip for you if you're looking for someone's birthday but there you go the open market opens on uh march 14th at 6 p.m eastern which is a monday uh, i wanted to talk about some of the kind of player updates and some of the player injuries as well and i wanted to start with james harden uh you know he's obviously not injured anymore he didn't play in the all-star game um, which was a point of contention in terms of who filled in for him and so on. I will say, if you haven't seen the uh, moment of the All-Star draft on TNT when Barkley and, and Shaq and the rest of those guys spoke with LeBron and Kevin Durant about picking uh, <laughs> James Harden last, if you haven't seen that, that is truly the high point of NBA comedy. But now that uh, James Harden is back, he has been great. And I have the numbers right here. In uh, two games played with the Sixers, Harden has 27 points, 12 assists, 8 rebounds. And is in the second game, he has a 29 point, 16 assist, 10 rebound, triple double. And later tonight on Wednesday, March 2nd, he plays the hapless New York Knicks. And it's, I think it kind of sucks that the Knicks suck again because, you know, they, the Knicks being good, I think, generally speaking, is good for the sport of basketball, given that, you know, New York is kind of like one of the, well, what are we going to call it, the meccas of basketball in North America. But at the same time, uh, they're not very good right now. And I ex fully expect James Harden to eviscerate them. So, Hey, uh, the ballers have to be very pleased. The Big River ballers <laughs> must be very, very pleased that uh, James Harden is finally healthy, is playing, and is contributing in a very meaningful way. And the ballers are already at, at or near the top of the standings. We'll take a look at that in a little bit. But boy, yeah, the, the ballers must be very pleased. Um, I don't know what the over-under is on James Harden made three-point shots are, but I'll say this. Here's a quick tidbit for you. He has taken... He has gone five of seven from three in game number one and three of seven from three in game number two. So if the over under is set at like two or three, I think I'm taking the over, especially against the Knicks tonight. So there's a little tidbit for you, for all of you uh, compulsive gamblers, DGens like myself out there. But uh, James Harden has been absolutely fantastic. I, whenever he crashes to the floor, I do kind of feel like you hold your breath a little bit. There was a clip we saw on Twitter, I think from a, a couple of days ago where the uh he like fell during during the shoot around the morning practice or whatever and he fell into the stands like the seats on the court side uh and uh, he looked he's clearly fine but it's just you kind of hold your breath whenever that happens but he has been excellent so far for both the sixers playing with joel Embiid and company and of course for the ballers as well um i want to get to a couple of injury tweets and this one is from adrian wojnarowski on victor oladipo uh, apparently victor oladipo is nearing a return 
according to ESPN insider Adrian Wojnarowski. Uh, we all, it's kind of exciting, right? Because we all kind of know the player he is from his days with the Pacers. Uh, he was an all-star, all-defensive first team. I believe all NBA third team as well, right? It's unfortunate. He's suffered some really bad injuries. I think he had the the torn quad tendon with the Pacers. And again, I think it was the same quadricep tendon with the Heat. But if he is back, I am very curious to see how he fits into the Miami rotation, right? It's a team that's already pretty loaded uh, at the top of the Eastern Conference, or at least they were tied with the Bulls for a little while. I'm sure they're going to stay at the top of the conference as well. How many minutes does he get when he's when he's eased back in, when he's fully healthy? Does that mean minutes for Butler and Adebayo, maybe Lowry? Do, do those kinds of do those minutes all decrease? How does the how does it all work out with Victor Oladipo when he comes back? Right, he's playing with the Sioux Fall Bandits or Rapids, I believe, whatever their minor league affiliate is. But he has been playing with them as he nears a return. Um, I'm not super worried. Eric Spolstra is one of the better coaches in the NBA, maybe a Hall of Famer. Maybe that's a conversation we can have a little later on. Uh, with Daniele, but he's a top-notch coach and he will work him in in the best way possible and uh, i would say that could probably be a real boon to a crusaders team in the ufba uh, that is seventh right now in the bird conference and trying to work their way out of the play-in tournament um, and into that top six it's definitely possible they're very close so i think uh having oladipa back if he if he recaptures anything close to how he played in indiana i think the crusaders and the heat in real life are going to be very happy um, I wanted to get to this one, too, before we look at the standings. John Morant. John Morant, we have a couple of images here for you. I mean, what a stud, right? Like, this guy is ridiculous. Look at, the, look at these averages over his past four games. 40.5 points per game, over 53% field goal percentage, and over 44% from the three-point line. That is crazy. John Morant is insane, right? Like, do we think the Pelicans are kicking themselves for taking Zion Williamson number one overall? I mean... It clearly seems like Zion doesn't want to play in a small market, whereas Morant has clearly embraced playing for a small market town like Memphis. Uh, it's great. We were having this debate the other day in the UFBA group chats. Is John Morant better than LaMelo Ball and or Anthony Edwards? I personally, I know this is like recency bias and maybe this is being a prisoner of the moment. I personally say yes. I personally say yes, especially Morant over Edwards. On LaMelo, I think it's a little it's a little more difficult because they're both point guards, but they both play different kinds of styles. They play, they just play a different style of basketball, generally speaking. Um, but I would probably still take John Morant, and I'm sure the Street Spirits, who took him as well, are very, very pleased as well. Um, but that actually kind of brings me to my next uh, comparison here. And we, there was a picture Ja himself tweeted out. Uh, you can see it here of um, him and Allen Iverson. No, obviously, this is a, <laughs> it's a Photoshop picture because AI does <laughs> not play basketball anymore. But I, it's funny because AI not only was he my arguably my favorite player when I was younger, and you can see below on the Twitter, like the Twitter caption here, uh, AI had hung Morant's jersey on his MVP trophy, which clearly I think AI clearly is a big fan of uh, Morant's game. And it's funny because I see a lot of AI in John ja Morant's game, right? Like people, maybe again, recency bias and you know the next big thing and so on. But AI and AI hasn't played in a long time. He is a member of the Basketball Hall of Fame, deservedly so in my opinion, uh, but people kind of forget how AI moved when he was on the court and the kind of point guard he was while being a little smaller. I think John Moran's maybe like a couple inches taller than AI, but at the same time, I just, I really like what Ja has been doing with the Grizzlies and it does really remind me of AI and his tenure with the Sixers and so on. So there you go. A shout out from Allen Iverson to Ja Morant and uh, reciprocated by the young guy as well. But John Morant playing like an MVP. He probably won't be the MVP this year, just like DeMar DeRozan, you know, probably will also not be the MVP this year. It's probably going to be, I don't know, Joel Embiid. Maybe it'll be Nikola Jokic, right? But at the same time, what those two guys are doing uh, cannot be understated. And again, the street spirits, I've got to be very pleased as they are almost definitely going to make the playoffs. And if John Morant can continue doing the ridiculous things he's doing, uh, I think the street spirits are going to go pretty far. Um, let's take a look at the standings before we get to our guest. And I guess Daniele Franceschi, our UFDA scouting director, is going to join us um, in a couple of minutes. But if we look here at the standings, here are the, the kind of playoff teams right now. Again, the way it works is green is playoff. Yellow are the guys in the playing tournament. Red are the people not in a playoff spot right now. Uh, in the Bird Conference on the left there, the Aviators, again, still atop the conference. What else is new there? They did lose Yus Yusuf Nurkic. Um, I think indefinitely, but he is supposed to be reevaluated in the not too distant future. The Majesty, the Ballers, the Sharpshooters, and the Arctic Wolves 
are all very clustered together. Look at that, right? They're basically within a string of maybe three to four games separate them from each other, not from the from the aviators, but from each other. Um, so the order of seeding is still very much up in the air with about, like I said, three to, uh, five to six weeks left in the regular season. And uh, you can see there the Cosmos holding on to that last play in spot for now. The Hyenas are right on their tail, right? Uh, they're only two games back. So again, we'll, uh, a lot of a lot of interesting, a lot of intrigue. Let's put it that way in the Bird Conference, in the Magic Conference on the right hand side, with the injuries to key players like Chris Paul. We talked about that, uh, that last week. OG Ananobi as well. He's a fractured finger. Um, the Midnight Owls have fallen further back of the Skyhooks, who uh, lead the league overall and the conference as well, fifty-seven and five. Um, man, five losses on the season at this point, I got to say, is very impressive. That's some like Bulls, Warriors type stuff. Very impressive stuff by the Skyhooks and their uh, rookie-laden squad. I know um, Mooch did lose Josh Giddy, I think, for a couple of weeks, although he's supposed to be coming back. Although Scotty Barnes and Evan Mobley and these guys can pick up the slack like they have been. I think the Skyhooks are in great shape. Uh, in the play-in spots, though, uh, the Battle Hounds and the Brigade are tied with uh, both teams just, well, let's see, one game out of a spot in the top six, which is currently the last spot currently occupied by the Reapers. So again, you can see there, uh, the Reapers only one game up on both the Battle Hound and the Brigade and two games up on the Street Spirit. So again, I think uh, a lot of a lot of basketball left to be played as we kind of wrap up with the standings there. I, you know, I think, generally speaking, there are going to be some movers and shakers. I think Maybe a couple teams in the uh, in the who are not in a playoff spot could make it into a play in spot. But again, we have to see what injuries come out here between now and the end of the regular season. But let's get to our guest. I mentioned it already. Daniele Franceschi, our UFBA scouting director, joins me here on this episode of UFBA Today. Daniele, how's it going, man? Show, sure, I'm doing well. Thanks for having me. Yeah, thanks for making time to come on and jump on. I know you're a busy guy, but um, thank you for making the lists. And you and I have spent <laughs> a lot of time over the last, gosh, like in basically all of 2022, it feels like so far. We have spent a lot of time compiling those lists. Uh, is there a guy when you were building the list that you thought for sure this guy is going to be a top five pick? I know you're very high on Jabari Smith, which is why you have him listed number one overall. Is there anyone mm -hmm. else, maybe let's say in the top five of this coming 2022 NBA draft class that you are like, you're so sure this guy is going to be a bona fide slam dunk pick for an NBA team and a UFBA team? Well, I would say the one, I mean, I think we have a clear top three, sort of a consensus okay. top three when it comes to this class in particular. Um, and that obviously includes Jabari Smith out of Auburn, and then you have your Chet Holmgren and Paulo Bancaro from Duke. Uh, the number four, number five spots is where things start to get interesting, and I don't know if, you know, like last year there was a lot of talk of it being a, a three-person draft, so to speak, and then there was a drop-off, and that was the point where the Raptors obviously made the decision, hey, we're going to go get Scotty Barnes at number four. I think with this class in particular, one guy I look to, and I, and I mean, he's, he had a stellar freshman year last year, decided to go back to school for a second year and be a sophomore uh, at Purdue, one of the best uh, programs and teams in the country right now, uh, Jaden Ivey. And I, I love what he does on both ends of the floor. I think his game has matured a lot uh, from his freshman season to now being a sophomore. And I think what you also see from him is just, I don't want to say necessarily the complacency, but it looks like he's really mastered the college game in a lot of ways. There's a level of, of uh, proficiency that he has getting to the basket basically i think where he's also really taking a step forward in his game is the ability to create his own shot and also play make something that he struggled with at times last year but even pick and roll usage for example this year has been upped and increased by matt painter and he's been very effective in those situations uh, so i would say in terms of a steady riser all year long and sort of solidifying a top five position to me, it's Jaden Ivey. I, the one guy I've been enamored with all year is Johnny Davis. But if we're talking about a guy that's sort of cemented his status in that kind of upper echelon, top tier, top five mm -hmm. conversation, it's it's Jaden Ivey for me. I like that. Okay. I like that a lot. I know I've heard a lot of really positive things about Ivy over the course of the season. And I'm sure a lot of people are really excited to see what he, what he has in the March Madness tournament, which starts. I can't, honestly, I can't believe we're so close to March Madness. It's uh, like it, it always feels maybe because of COVID and kind of delaying things and what you know, what's happened over the past two years. It it feels like 
we're slowly starting to get back to maybe a, a state of normalcy or maybe I mean, the new normal, as people like to say, which is kind of a cliche now, but I think it is true to a certain degree. So I am excited to see March Madness starting very, very soon. And Jaden Ivey definitely going to be a part of that. What you mentioned, Johnny Davis, what do you like about his game and where do you where do you see him? I, I know it's kind of hard outside the top five to solidify, say, all right, teams are going to pick this guy in this range. But where do you see him going and what, what are some things you like about his game? We talk about a guy like, I mean, if we want to sort of look at steady risers and guys who have really seen their stock absolutely take off and skyrocket, um, I think he's at the top of the list. The other guy I would say is Keegan Murray from Iowa, who, you know, sort of was on the periphery heading into the season and people being like, well, you know, who's going to who's going to have the opportunity to be the guy at Iowa after Luca Garza is now obviously in the NBA with Detroit Pistons. And it's been Keegan Murray. With Johnny Davis, you know, last year as a freshman, sort of a more sheltered role, and there were kind of glimpses you got here and there. But from day one back in, I guess, November or so, when I watched Wisconsin play, and this team was not expected to do a ton in their conference. Like, this is a team that was, we're not talking about one of those consensus preseason teams that everybody was like, hey, look, they might have an opportunity to be in that conversation to win their regular season conference title and and do damage in the NCAA tournament, they're going to be on the three or four line in the NCAA tournament. And then it's really, I, I mean, I think the measure show, when we look at a lot of these players, you got to ask yourself, what what would that team look like if you took them, out, you remove them from the equation? And like, if you remove Johnny Davis from Wisconsin, they are not, a, they might not even be a tournament team. Um, and that is, I think that is the strongest sort of compliment you can pay to him. But in terms of his actual skill set, he's absolutely just like electric in the open floor, going to the basket, creating his own shot, his own creating his own offense. Like the, the ability to create separation off the dribble, to get to the basket, to finish around the rim with touch, and then he can shoot the ball. Now he's had a couple of spurts. Recently, where he struggled from the perimeter, but not overly concerned. He's gotten more on, on track recently, and he had some big games, especially early in the season, where you were just kind of in awe. And and I, you get a, a feeling like Jalen Suggs, and I know it hasn't necessarily shown it, uh, you know, hasn't manifested itself at the NBA level yet for a guy like that. But last year when I watched him, I watched his first college game. It was, uh, I think they were, they were playing in a preseason tournament, Gonzaga was. And it was against Auburn or Kansas. And I just remember watching him and being absolutely in awe. The athleticism, just a natural feel for the game. And I watch Johnny Davis and I see a lot of those same qualities. Maybe not to that same level and extent as what Jalen Suggs showed, but I see a lot of similarities. And it was something where and and immediately when I when I watched him play this year, I was I was amazed and I was excited and I felt like this guy's gonna see his stock. Sore, and sure enough, it has to where I you see a lot of these prognosticators have him inside that top five. Certainly, a lottery pick and inside the top ten. It's very interesting, but that's what I, I really like, and I've I've enjoyed, I've thoroughly enjoyed watching him all season long. So let me ask you this, then, Danielle. Now that we've seen Cade Cunningham and Evan Mobley and Scotty Barnes and the rest of these guys uh, play meaningful minutes in the NBA this year, and we've seen what their games are like and how they've evolved. I mean. Heck, you and I watch a lot of Scotty Barnes, like you mentioned, and mm-hmm. you know his game has changed even from the beginning of the year to now. I mean, the guy's played more basketball this year than he ever had in college. Uh, I just a lot of people said that last year's draft class, the 2021 draft class, was uh, you know they like to use the word we like to throw around the word generational in the media, right? And I I, I don't always I always I don't always agree when we use that word because we use it a lot in the NFL, we use it a lot in the, in hockey. Um, and I'm sure we're going to be having that conversation about Shane Wright and Connor Bedard, for example, in the hockey world in the not too distant future. But when you compare last year's top draft picks, Cunningham, Mobley, Barnes, Suggs, Green, and you can you can add in Wagner and some of the other guys, Kaminga and so on as well, if you really want to. If you compare them to this year's top class of guys like Jabari Smith, Holmgren, um, you know, you mentioned a couple other guys like uh, like Johnny Davis and Ivy and so on. How do you think it compares in terms of NBA potential? Very good question. Um, I think it's interesting. I would say, you know, I I thought, I think 
what is, what's fascinating about this class in particular is the three guys at the top, there's a lot of consternation, if you will, about sort of who is really number one. Last year, I think it was more clear cut with Kate Cunningham, and, and he, like, he cemented it with the way he played at Oklahoma right. State, and he was incredible. And just the decision-making, the ability to make plays when it really mattered, clutch moments, and him really stepping up and showing he, he was, you know, had that, I guess, the cool temperature, if you will, to make big plays when it matters late in games. Um, Evan Mobley would be, I think, the guy that when you look at how everything panned out, maybe in hindsight could have been or should have been the number one pick. He seems to be thriving in Cleveland. His skill set's really unique. I I would say this crop, this the top three in particular, the top end of this draft, I think is is just as strong as what we saw last year. I also think that the three this year have the opportunity to potentially be more, um, you know, transformational, if you will, in terms of what their skill set will mean in the NBA. Jabari Smith is a guy that can play the three or the four in the NBA level, depending on what team and sort of the stylistic tendencies of that team, whatever team he ends up with, that, you know, he can shoot the ball from the perimeter. He's good defensively. He's not a guy that you need to run plays for or get the ball in his hands frequently. But, like, look how many guys we've seen show over the years sort of have similar, like, look at Jason Tatum. Like, he just blossomed. He goes from Duke, where obviously you're playing a different style of basketball and at the college level, and now you go to the NBA and you have sort of the handcuffs, all sort of handcuffs are off, and you can do whatever you want. You have freedom to do whatever you want, and he was an absolute monster. And Jabari Smith, you just watch him and, I mean, in fairness, I think Bruce Pearl, especially in March here, needs to give him the ball a little bit more, to be honest, because he's been so damn good when he has the opportunity to touch it almost every single possession. Um, and then I look at Chet, and Chet Holmgren, with with what he does, he gets a rebound, and he'll take it the length of the floor and and flush it on somebody. I mean, you don't, you don't see that. There wasn't a guy in the draft last year that could do that, Evan Mobley included. His ability to block shots, to hit shots from the perimeter, um, you know, to be an unbelievable defensive force, like in the NBA, that is extremely useful when you're when you have a, a seven footer who's agile, who can shoot it from the perimeter, who the defenses have to respect when he's like pulling the ball up and bringing the ball across the timeline in transition. Um, and then Paulo Bancaro, who I think if you look back to November, December, probably would have been in a lot of people's eyes the number one pick given how his freshman season started. Um, He's got a really unique skill set, and he also does it on both ends. And I think even his usage has slipped as of late a little bit. Plays a ton of minutes, but in terms of just the amount of shots he's taken per game and the way that he's used offensively, I, I mean, we haven't seen him really even in pick and roll a ton, you know, because they at Duke with Mark Williams, they they like utilizing him, but he's proven he can shoot the basketball from the perimeter as well. I think those three guys have the opportunity, the potential to be more of a generational crop than the than last year's group but both are really strong obviously and i think it's interesting it'll be interesting to chart that uh but the way those three and their skill set and how it translates to the nba i think there's a lot more intrigue you know Cade's more of a traditional point guard uh, even if you want to throw Suggs in that group of you know top three four from last year's like we're talking about a point guard what what's what was intriguing about him is just his athleticism from that position and then you know mobley a center that blocks shots, runs well, is agile, has shown he can shoot it a little bit. There's room for growth in his game, obviously, but these three are really, really unicorns in a lot of ways. Yeah, Mobley not a not a bad passer as well as we saw during yeah. the uh, skills challenge, right? <laughs> on All Star Weekend and <laughs> certainly on uh, in actual games too, but uh, most recently in the uh, in the All Star Challenge. Um, yeah, I, like, I I would love to see honestly, I would love to see. Holmgren play with someone like Cade Cunningham, but let's say he does end up going to the Pistons, which I, I think is possible at the very least, right? At this point, we'll have to see what happens between now and the end of the regular season. But seeing someone like Holmgren and Cunningham play with each other, because like you said, you, how often do you see a seven-footer take the ball himself from, from basket to basket and just flush it on someone? You don't, right? You just don't see that all that often. He's like he's he's so skinny. I want I mean, but you know what? That was a criticism levied against dare I say Scotty Barnes or Evan Mobley, right? But if these guys are young, they'll put on weight, put on muscle as they get accustomed to. Uh, NBA conditioning and NBA training staffs and so on. So I am very excited to see where all of these guys go. Uh, real quick, uh, if we move over to next year's class, the 23 class, I know there are a couple of names we wanted to talk about, but first I, I had to ask you, what like what kind of difference maker 
is Victor Wembanyama out of France going to be? Because we just talked about uh, Chet Holmgren and the you know, seven-footer kind of freakish athlete he is. Well, I feel like Victor Wembanyama might be even better potentially. Very similar uh, in terms of skill set. Chet, to be quite honest, maybe a little more polished, especially as a shooter. But, I mean, this is a kid in Wembenyama, uh, again, very similar frame, very even same same in terms of physique, very slight, right? Like, the, the build is the same. But um, it's funny, they actually, I mean, they did play against each other uh, on the international level last summer. Um, I believe it was the U19s or U20s, I can't recall specifically. Right. Uh, but the United States won that tournament, uh, and, and they played France in the final. Um, and Victor Wembenyama is... <laughs> again i would say there's a lot of parallels like i think there's a ton of parallels between the two of them chet and and Wembenyama. the skill set's very similar um and that's why i think there's a lot of intrigue because you don't see those kind of prospects come around too often i think like if we want to use sort of a, a a more like a com like an example of somebody of that size who's you know a guy who's gonna get drafted he's canadian as well show but i'll use zach Eady as an example He's a seven foot four monster, tight titan of a man. Um, plays for Purdue, obviously, and he's more of your traditional center. What you're going to get with a guy like that is he's rebounding. You know, he's going to post up on the block. You know, he he's improved as a passer as well, but you're just going to get that right. And Purdue does a good job of utilizing him. They use his size obviously to their advantage, and he's able to post and just shoot over the top of guys and make decisions off of that kick out to the perimeter. When you're talking about homegrown and women, Yama, what, what is so intriguing about these guys is, like we said, there aren't many seven-footers in general who can get you a rebound, push it the length of the floor, run your offense, facilitate, shoot from the perimeter. How do you guard that? And that is where I think those two are, in particular, it's why they're such intriguing prospects. Uh, you mentioned something about Chet in terms of his physique and sort of the, the you know, him being extremely skinny and you got to think as well and and again victor wembenyama has got a similar build imagine if these guys were to put on a little bit more muscle and even just be more physical than they are now and what i think is interesting and i have this whole philosophical divide when it comes to college basketball and the nba i i personally i will say it i enjoy watching the college game a lot more because the coaching aspect of things defensively the schemes and the tactics it's just a different game altogether but a lot of these stars, and this is why I think Jabari Smith can be a star, especially in the NBA, is the, the game becomes easier to these guys. The defense is not as hard, right? There's no defensive three in the key rule, right? You you can't have a guy in the NBA sit in the, just a big paint, um, you know, park himself in the paint and sit there for a possession. Zone defense is not really is a thing, but, you know, it's, it's a quasi zone because obviously you can't have a big park himself in the paint. And then additionally, you're not seeing presses. There's there's just different variables. Those two guys are intriguing for all those different reasons. They give you something that you're not going to find in the average prospect. That's why I think it's fascinating. Um, and that's why, you know, Wemben Yama in particular is such an intriguing prospect. Yeah, I, I am I am very much looking forward to uh next year and to see where guys like Wembenyama go, where Scoot Henderson goes and so on. Um before I let you go, I got to ask Shaden Sharp, is certainly a Canadian prospect. He is uh from London, Ontario, I believe, right? But the the yep. issue the issue and the most interesting part of the Shaden Sharp saga, I guess, has been his eligibility, right? And, and where when he's going to play and the coaches have been very particular about letting him play and I'm sure his family and his agent and so on are a big part of that decision-making process as well. Can you explain the, because you and I have decided to let Shaden Sharp be included in the futures auction. He's going to be one of the 2023 draft class players and that's a group of 60, but you know, it's possible he doesn't play and his eligibility is kind of up in the air. Can you just explain maybe a Coles notes version of what's been going on with uh, Shaden Sharp? Yeah. So with Shaden Sharp, um, what happened was he he enrolled at Kentucky early. We've seen this with some players over the years. It's not entirely uncommon for them to do this. Uh, Hamadou Diallo is just an example that pops in my head, and he did the same thing at Kentucky and also went through the same sort of situation where the eligibility was clear for him to play potentially as like a second half of the season guy. They made the decision ultimately not to do that, and the same thing has played out here with Shaden Sharp, where he, as of I believe it was you know going into the new year, was ruled to be eligible to play for Coach Cal, Kentucky, this season. 
And certainly, I think there were a lot of you know talent evaluators that were eager and interested to see that unfold. Um, Kentucky has since obviously come out and said, hey, we're making the decision um, to not have Shade and Sharp play this season, and they're hopeful that he will come back and play next year. Where What's interesting about this whole situation is he is eligible for the draft still. So the NBA, they've ruled that he will be eligible to be in this year's draft class if he were to declare and come out before playing a freshman season at Kentucky. In my estimation, we're still looking at certainly a top 10 pick, but depending on what teams think and how they evaluate, he could be a top five kind of guy. Like he could easily usurp. I don't think he would usurp Jaden Ivey, just given the body of work he's put together, but he could usurp, you know, certainly Benedict Matherin, a fellow Canadian. He could usurp Johnny Davis, who I I do like. But he, <laughs> this guy's really special. And I remember watching him as a ninth grader playing for LBA, and he had 50 something points in a game on the Ooh. national junior circuit uh, for a London basketball academy team that um outside of him. You know, nobody really knew a lot of these kids, and he's out there, and he was just absolutely dominating, beating double teams, triple teams, just giving teams headaches, single-handedly almost winning games for for that team. And so that was the first real eye-opener for me. And then we look at how he sort of progressed in this uh, this past summer, playing on the AAU circuit for, for Uplay. That's really where his stock really, really soared, and, and, t- and colleges – sort of started taking a ton of note, like the main you know, teams from these Power, power Five conferences, the Kentuckys of the world, so to speak, um, started taking notice. NBA draft uh, scouts and evaluators were like, man, this guy this guy's going to be uh, an elite talent, and he certainly is because he's the total package in a lot of ways. Just I would use one word to describe him, explosive. So his situation is unique, um, and I think, if obviously, if you're a Kentucky fan, you hope he goes back and plays a year there. Um, personally, as a fan of college basketball, I would like to see him play a year there, but you know, in show there may not be a benefit for him. It, it just depends on the decision they make. It'll be interesting and fascinating to follow leading up to the draft here, what he decides to do. Yeah, it's going to be, that is one of the most interesting cases, I think, but on, on an individual player basis for, for this year's, especially for us at the UFBA, because we have two draft classes in the same futures auction, right? If this was just one yeah. draft class, maybe you could have this conversation in a different kind of a different view, a different lens. But because we're having the 2022 and the 23 draft classes combined, I mean, he's, he's almost definitely going to be drafted in one of those years, right? So I, uh, mm-hmm. I find it really interesting. So that's why we made the decision to have him uh, be eligible for uh, the scouts to draft or scouts to purchase in the futures auction on March 12th. Um, I got to ask real quick, uh, is there a, I've never asked this before, actually, is there a team you follow, like a specific college team, or do you kind of just watch all teams, if that makes sense? I, no, sure. I try to watch as much as possible. Um, and I follow. Certainly on the daily, it doesn't matter who's playing. I'm pretty much trying to follow and watch as many teams and games as I can. Um, you know, the ones you get obviously on mostly on television are the all the, you know the Power Five conference teams. But uh, no, certainly like I, I, I'm watching Ivy League. I'm, I'm watching you know Mountain West. I'm watching the West Coast Conference. Like there's different. There's so many different things. Uh, you know, and and again. Like it's so fascinating for the purpose of what you know our our UFBA owners are interested in. It's a lot of the top prospects, right? Like it's just it's all the guys who are playing at these bigger schools, and then you know you get the guys under. Look at John Moran. I mean, you talked about him earlier. <laughs> it's the guy who went to Murray State. Should have probably been the number one pick in hindsight in that year in that draft, uh, given how well he's performed. Um, so you get stories like that, um, but mainly, you know, we got all these evaluators watching these these big sort of well-known blue blood teams. Uh, but no, I, I follow everything closely. And I wanted to just mention one thing on, on Shade and Sharp show that you brought yeah. up. It would be a catastrophe <laughs> if he ends up having to play more than one year in college. That would be a colossal failure for the poor guy. And you got to take those things into consideration because it, it can happen, right? But um, yeah. yes, so we will not see. I would be shocked if we saw him play more than a season so if he's not in this class he'll be in the next one almost i would say 99.5 percent. i am sure of that okay well, there you go good to know I, I i you're probably right right i mean especially with 
you know, we live in we live in an era of player empowerment, and certainly that's the case in the NBA. But it has very slowly trickled down to the college game. And, uh, you know, I, I feel like with the G League and how players are moving over to the G League, I mean, we have a number of the Ignite players in, in yeah. both years' draft classes, right? So it'll be fascinating to see where a lot of those guys go as well in terms of not having played for a college team or having played only a very little amount for college franchises or college, uh, college squads, right? And, and here they are now getting eligible for the 22 and 23 NBA draft classes. Is there a team you're keeping your eye on for March Madness? We always know in the first uh, yeah. couple of games, there's like, a, you know a 12 seeded team that upsets the five seeded team or something like that it's always going to happen it's the nature of march madness it's what makes it so fun is there a team you're keeping your eye on maybe one of the lower seeded teams that might go uh, you know have a, a cinderella run as they call it i'm not sure where they'll be seated show but the one team i think I, I i believe will win a game at least i one game is saint mary's i Ooh, think okay. saint mary's and i watched them play against gonzaga over the weekend and it's a veteran team. They have. We're talking about like they. They don't even have. They guys were not even five star recruits coming out of high school. But the style of basketball they play, the discipline that they have, a veteran coaching staff. I think that team wins a game, at least a game. That would be my prediction. They'll be probably a double digit seed, um, somewhere in the double digit range, and. I believe they will win a game. I'm pretty bullish on them to at least do that. There are some others, and I, I guess it'll depend on the seed, the seed lines, and the matchups. Right. But that's one where I look and I say, almost regardless of matchup, I'm 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 very bullish on on them uh, winning a game. Like I, I think they have, you know, they have a veteran guy, uh, a point guard, and Tommy Kuzi who just knows how to play the game. Like it's not flashy, not not like like it's just you watch. It's the most like you know vanilla sort of style of point guard play you'll ever see but he's effective and then they have good bigs and they know how to play together like the chemistry that that team has so that's why i kind of i like them and i think they they are they are due to win a tournament game okay saint mary so get saint mary into your uh, march madness brackets as we get ready for uh, Give an selection upset. sunday Give them an yeah upset. there you go I like it. I like it a lot. I, so there you go. Selection Sunday, the day after the futures auction. So maybe uh, we can keep our eyes on St. Mary in this year's March Madness tournament. But Danielle, um, I appreciate you spending some time with me here on UFBA today. I'm glad we got to chat about the futures auction. I'm sure we'll do this again soon, especially when the uh, tournament gets underway. But uh, thanks again for joining us here. That was a lot of fun, show. Thank you so much. And let's have some fun. March is the best month for college basketball. Let's have a fun month. Oh, yeah, absolutely. I totally agree. There he is. Daniele Franceschi, UFBA scouting director here for UFF Sports. That kind of does it for this episode of UFBA Today. Uh, thank you again for watching, listening, rating, reviewing, subscribing, all that good stuff. And we will talk to you again this week. You've been watching another episode of the Ultimate Fantasy Sports Network. Uh -huh.